All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Pierre Ortlieb. Uh, I uh, am head of policy analysis at ONCIF, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, a, a great panel today for our session on implementing ESG and reserves and asset management. Um, so with us today are Martin Flodin, Deputy Governor at the Riks Bank, uh, Peter Zöllner, Head of the Banking Department at the Bank for International Settlements, Jonathan Bailey, who is uh, Managing Director and Head of ESG Investing at Neuberger Bergman, uh, and Thorsten Meyer Larsen, uh, Head of Reserves Management and Collateral at uh, the Danish Central Bank. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure having you here today to discuss some of the some of the key issues around, around ESG and sustainability in, in reserves and asset management. So uh, I propose we start with just some brief three to five minute opening remarks from, from each of you. Um, so maybe we'll start with, uh, with Martin uh, from the uh, Swedish Riksbank. Martin, do you wanna kick us off with some brief remarks? Yes, so thanks a lot. And thanks for inviting me to, to this panel. So I want to spend a few minutes, uh, I hope to, to be able to be brief on our mandate and how it relates to sustainability. Uh, I think this is key be before I get into uh, at least one example on how, how we have adjusted our actual investments uh, because of sustainability questions. There, there has been today and, and also previously, of course, but, but I've been listening a little bit to, to the previous uh, sessions a lot of discussion about uh, the central bank's uh, mandates. And I think this is very interesting. And I noted also that we seem to have different interpretations, all of us. I, I've already heard a number of different interpretations. And I think my interpretation is a little bit different again uh, to, to what I heard uh, previously. So uh, similar to most other central banks, the primary objectives of, of, for the Riks Bank is to maintain price stability and loosely speaking to, to promote financial stability. So, so this is a same starting point, I think, as for, for everyone. And given this, it's obvious, and I think everyone agrees that the central banks, we must understand how climate change affects uh, in the inflation process and how it affects uh, risks in, uh, in the markets. Uh, and, I think it's clear also that central banks have an important role here in, in providing analysis, uh, in uh, coming with recommendations to the markets, and uh, also depending on, on what role they have as supervisors to provide regulation uh, on the markets. Um, so, so that's one part of it, and that's clear. The other thing that is clear, and I think Sabine focused a lot on this in, in the previous session, is that a central bank has to, to use public finances prudently and, and think about risk management. So to the extent that the climate change uh, induces risks that are not properly measure, measured by credit rating agencies, et cetera, uh, we have to be a bit cautious and do our own analysis. Uh, so we have to manage the risks on our own balance sheet. That, that's obvious. Um, and I think also central banks can set a, a good example by being transparent, for example, about, about our risks, etc. So, so far, I agree with, with Sabine, but, but I, and, and I think this is not controversial at, at all. But, but the more difficult question, and where I've heard some other interpretations now, is uh, if and how central banks within their mandates can contribute to mitigating climate change. Um, and it, it's obvious that the most effective measures uh, to limit climate change, they fall uh, within the remit of other policy areas. Uh, my interpretation is that our mandate uh, can and shall contribute at least a little bit to mitigating climate change. Uh, as long as our primary objectives uh, are met, that is price stability and financial stability, the Riks Bank shall, according to our mandate, support the objectives of general economic policy. And it says actually specifically in the, in the preparatory work for our legislation from the 1990s, uh, that uh, we shall promote sustainable growth and high employment. I think when they wrote sustainable growth, they didn't have climate in, in mind, but uh, working against imbalances, et cetera. But it says promote sustainable growth. Uh, so consequently, I, I, to me, it's clear that the Riksbank is supposed to act for sustainable development uh, 
as long as it's in line with the ambitions of the Swedish parliament and government. Uh, and as long as, as it's compatible with the primary objectives that, that we have. Uh, but you have to note that our potential to contribute here is limited. It should not be overstated. And our measures will only be com a complement to, to other policy. I, I think also what I just said now, it deviates a little bit from what I heard in some of the previous sessions. Uh, we cannot use our primary objective as a reason for being activists uh, when it comes to, to mitigating climate change. Price stability and climate change, they are very different questions. They are not really related, except that they affect each other a little bit. And arguably, of course, uh, central bank objectives are subordinate to climate change and other sustainability questions. So central bank activism in this area, it cannot be based on the importance of price stability. The other questions are arguably more important. So given this uh, background, I, I will give you at least one example now of what we have done. When it comes to uh, reserve management, our foreign exchange reserves. One reason for why we hold FX reserves is to be able to provide liquidity in foreign currency to the Swedish market if there is a financial crisis. Um, and to be able to do this, our portfolio should be dominated by safe and liquid US dollar assets, basically US treasuries. But historically, our FX reserves, we have not only held US treasuries, but we have diversified away from, from that to some extent uh, to promote uh, good public finances. We have uh, seeked a little bit of higher return and lower risk. Uh, diversifying into relatively safe, relatively liquid assets in other currencies in, in particular. Uh, but thinking about and caring about public finances, that's part, it's not part of our, of our primary objective, it's part of the secondary objective, precisely as caring about climate and, and, and promoting sustainable growth. So I, I think, um, and, and we, we concluded this in 2019, the, the executive board, that we cannot diversify away into to higher returns if that means a, a larger carbon footprint. So, so that conclusion led us to include uh, climate concerns and, and eventually also ESG concerns into the decision process for our FX reserve portfolio. And it had an immediate impact that in, in that we actually reallocated assets in our FX uh, reserves. So we sold assets from issuers with, uh, with a large carbon footprint. Yes, the, uh, the, the, the uh, regional government bonds in Australia being one notable example, I think that many of us- Yes, for, so the, the regional uh, government bonds in yeah. Australia and Canada, we reallocated within those country portfolios to, to uh, issuers with lower, uh, lower carbon footprint. Uh, so, so that's Martin, I'm just I'm just gonna just gonna have to to stop you there so that we yes, can I'm, allow I'm allow allow to I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you for for those uh, for those points. I think there's a lot to unpack there, and 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 uh, we'll come to some of those points later on. Just before we move on to Torsten for his his remarks and and maybe reactions to your points. Just two points. Uh, we've we've just been joined by uh, Wilhelm Moon, who is the uh, global co-head of corporate governance at uh, Norges Bank Investment Management. Thank you for joining us, Wilhelm. And just secondly, um, I, I do encourage everyone who's listening in to send in questions through the chat function um, that we can then discuss uh, with, with our panel. So with those two points being said, uh, Torsten, over to you for some, for some brief remarks. Thank you, and thank you for uh, also inviting me. Uh, I'm relatively new to the reserve management uh, community as I only started 1st of May. I used to be on the other side of the table trying to sell the bonds to, to all of you guys as, a, as a working in the government debt office. So, uh, but uh, yeah, ESG was also a part of a big part of the work uh, being done in the, in the government debt side. So uh, it's, a, it's a familiar topic, I would say. <laughs> I think all of us. Uh, Feel that way. Uh, I'm going to be a bit practical uh, and focus today on uh, sort of what we specifically do on our uh, part of our portfolio, the, the equity and corporate bond portfolio. Um, as you, some of you may know, uh, we ha have uh, most of, if not, we have all of our exposure in, in corporate bond equity space and uh, through uh, ETFs, which 
for some of you, it's a, it's a, it's a part of your uh, portfolio as well, but for others, it's, it's, a, it's an... Uh, strange animal. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a few remarks on that and what that means for our ESG uh, ideas and thoughts. Um, so first of all, uh, why, why look at this part of the portfolio is when one, one reason being that this is where it matters. This is where we have a large part of our, our risks, uh, including uh, any climate related risks that might uh, arise. Uh, but it's also where it could actually uh, theoretically could be argued that it would matter most in, in, um, in the real economy. So that's basically why we, 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 we focus on this area to, uh, in the first place. And then, uh, as, as I said, our investment strategy on this area is, is through ETFs. Um, there's some historic reasons for this, but of course, one obvious one is it is it's sort of arm's length. We don't have any uh, direct equity exposure on our books. And secondly, it's, uh, it's uh, at least in some cases, a cost-efficient way of gaining a, a general and broad exposure to, to, to the sectors involved in, in, the, in the indices. So it's a standardized solution and uh, because it's the standardized package or standardized solution that we buy into, it, it also raises some, some, some questions when we start to uh, have specific attitudes towards uh, specific sectors uh, related to ECG topics. So I'm going to say a few words on that and then uh, leave it the floor to the next panelist. Uh, first of all, we've always had this screening criteria on our ETFs, uh, also climate related screening criteria. They used to be a bit more, uh, they are a bit more modest than we expect them to be very soon. Uh, but uh, sort of, uh, we've always tried to um, sort of avoid, uh, have a policy to avoid uh, financial transactions. They're supposed to be according to all rules. We have to follow conventions, international guidelines, etc. cetera. Um, for obvious reasons. We also have sanctions lists that we require from our foreign ministry to, to avoid certain areas. And we follow the UN Global Compact, 10 principles. Um, so I would say pretty standard criteria. We also have some kind of related criteria involved, mainly tar sand and uh, thermic uh, coal. Um, and also other uh, various criteria for instance, uh, tobacco screenings. Um, so we do already have screenings in place, but what is very interesting, of course, is what, what will go, go on from here. And of course, we all know that we have to have stronger screening criteria, more work has to be done in this area. And that's also why we are looking at the, how to become Paris aligned with our portfolio in the equity space, which I'm gonna focus on today. Um, we take we took a look at our portfolio and, and I don't know if it's surprising, but quite a lot of the portfolio is actually uh, uh, in areas or sectors where you see uh, very carbon intensive uh, production or other areas. So eight to 10% of our portfolio is actually invested in sectors that are uh, um, oil intense, uh, oil or gas, have a high degree of oil or gas exposure. So that is a case study, you could say, for what to do. And, uh, and one main question, of course, is are, are these companies in those sectors doing enough? Uh, uh, and do they have uh, credible plans for what to do in the, in the future years? Uh, you can do a lot of work on this, and we all are. Um, but uh, looking at data, the analytics, uh, MSCI data, whatever's out there, you could, you could spend a lot of time on this, and, and we have also done this um, uh, and, and reached some conclusions, and that is that, that we do have a lot of companies in our ETFs that do not fulfill the requirements uh, currently. And that leaves us with the question, what should we do with these uh, companies? And, and again, because this is like a package solution, we don't have a segregated uh, mandate. Um, so we can't really just uh, invest and do active management currently, something we're looking into, whether that's a, 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 something we can do. Um, so very keen on any uh, thoughts you might have on this. Uh, but currently we are, we are sort of in the ETF space. Uh, that also means that, that it's difficult to conduct any direct uh, ownership uh, policies vis-a-vis um, -vis the companies. So you basically buy into the stewardships involved in the ETF providers, what they, whatever they do. Um, and that sort of leaves us uh, with one option, and that's the divestment, exclusion. And if you sort of follow the Paris uh, 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 criteria, it's not necessarily the right way to go forward. But Again, that's some of the thoughts that we are currently having. What's what's the right step to do? But if you if you take the concrete case of an ETF, uh, we believe that, that we need to uh, divest 
and that means looking at other indices to invest in. And that process is uh, ongoing. Uh, of course, there are some uh, obvious alternatives out there like PAP indices or, or climate uh, uh, transition benchmarks uh, that you could look into. Main, main, the main difference could be that you, if, whether or not you want to include oil gas companies in your portfolio. Um, so those are alternatives. We're looking yeah. into this. And, I think and yeah, the, the issue of, of benchmarking is an important one that I want to unpack a little bit, a little bit later, especially, you know, including in the context of the ETF issue and kind of customizability versus standardization. Just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna gonna park that theme just for a, for a second before we come back to it. I'm gonna uh, ask Jonathan to come in here. Jonathan, you, you have some, some remarks as well on, on the issue of mandates and, and what role central banks can play in this discussion. Thank you, Torsten. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. And, and you know, far be it for me to tell central banks how to interpret their mandate, but I, I do think that some of the remarks that Madame Lagarde has made on on this, you know, is instructive. Um, and in our view, you know, it's entirely consistent with focusing on price stability to understand the link between climate change and increased volatility of inflation. You know, just to think about the trillions of dollars that will be deployed over the next 30 years on physical adaptation and resilience, as well as the technological shifts, that spending could be very lumpy if we don't have managed pricing of climate risk. And lumpy spending, as we all know, tends to increase both the frequency and the amplitude of the economic cycles, hence leading to price instability. Um, you know, you're going to have to see budgetary decision making by national governments shifting from sort of more stable, but perhaps less positive military spending towards infrastructure and other investments, right, which again tends to, to be more lumpy. Uh, you know, and, and, and that could obviously lead to um, issues around you know, devaluation uh, and weakening of the dollar, which you know, tends to increase uh, uh, trade flows and inflation in, in the emerging markets. So there's a number of reasons there why you might say, you know, price stability is linked to, to climate that, that's within the core, but obviously, you know, some central banks have other dual mandates and so on that allow them to approach it from other angles. So, so we think that, that that motivates an appropriate focus on it within the core mandate. Um, but even if you don't buy that, right, you know, these are material risks to individual credits and to individual securities. Um, so hence, you know, you should be evaluating them as part of a, a fiduciary investment process, uh, at, just as, you know, Torsten and, and, and Martin have sort of uh, identified. In our, in our view, then, then what do you do? How do you actually act on this? Um, and we think there's a sort of four parts uh, process. Uh, that can be helpful. Uh, the I, I'd say it's the easy bit, but but it, as as Thorsten has described, it's not always easy. Is to take things off the table, right? Which is let's make sure that we're not investing uh, in uh, in issuers and activities that are clearly uh, misaligned uh, with with an appropriate climate transition, whether that's thermal coal or or tar sands um, uh, or, or issuers in local governments that are dependent upon that. Um, and, and while that can be controversial, at least I think there is growing consensus around the things you want to take off the table. Um, but once you've gone past that, the, the next stage in our view is the, is the evaluation of uh, alignment potential. Um, and so we think that there are a, a number of frameworks that are helpful for evaluating that, whether it's the work of the science-based targets initiative, uh, which uh, you know, verifies the commitments that individual issuers are making, uh, whether it's the work of the, the London School of Economics' Transition Pathways Initiative, which is modeling uh, on a sector level. Um, and, and so we've implemented these types of frameworks in, in our processes. And it's so important to do that in credit because, of course, you know, many of these issuers are raising primary capital from, from all of you. Um, and so what that capital is used I think we've we've lost uh, Jonathan. Um, so I think um, just in the interest of uh, of, of moving along, um, unless yeah, I think I think we've lost Jonathan. So just in, in the interest of uh, of keeping this flowing, um, Peter, do you want to do you want to come in as well? Um, just uh, before we turn to our, our final panelist, Wilhelm, just on on some of these on some of these issues as well. Sure, sure, my pleasure. Uh, hello, everybody. Great, uh, great pleasure to be on this panel. 
Well, we just have heard uh, two central bankers talking a bit about their approach uh, when it comes to implementing ESG uh, criteria in reserve management. The BIS actually is an institution owned by, 30, by, by 63 central banks and doing business with more than 150 official institutions uh, globally. So probably I could add a bit uh, of a uh, flavor of what, what we see globally, what central banks do, and then add probably what the BIS itself is doing uh, in, in their own balance sheet and pension fund. So let me start probably with uh, the global overview. We do a yearly uh, survey where usually about 120 central banks would respond. And we, we find that clearly more than 50%, more than actually 60% in the latest survey uh, have told us that uh, ESG criteria play uh, or will play a major role in when, uh, when developing investment strategies and implementing portfolio structures. Uh, when it comes to monetary policy portfolios, which in some cases is huge uh, due to the asset purchase programs of many central banks, uh, there is a much lower tendency to use ESG ratios. Only 4% of more than 100 respondents answered that they did so for statutory or legal obligations, and 8% only indicated that they follow stakeholders' instructions when it comes to um, monetary policy portfolios, which means that central banks stick to this uh, principle of relative price neutrality when implementing monetary policy. So here I think uh, the channel is not very great to integrate uh, ESG uh, criteria. However, when it comes to the management of the official currency reserves, there we have 68% uh, of uh, the central banks responding and the whole set of uh, the survey covers more than 94% of the reserves in the world. So it's a very, very comprehensive uh, uh, survey. 68% of the central banks tell us that it is very important for them to include criteria or they are in the process of implementing this criteria into their uh, investment philosophies. Uh, which means that in addition to this uh, triangle, liquidity, safety, and return, central banks more and more include sustainability. Now, uh, of course, what we see is not every central bank goes uh, sort of uh, as far as others. Uh, some central banks would say, well, it's still the main uh, responsibility for governments to take care of it. But 68% of central banks saying this is important is uh, really a strong, a strong number and shows that this is not simply a fashion, that this is a trend which will stay. What is the BIS doing to support or to service uh, the reserve management uh, of uh, these many central banks? We offer products uh, and we offer early on an ESG uh, linked a corporate bond, BZIP. The BZIP is an open-ended fund, a BIS investment pool where central banks buy units. So here we started with a very simple strategy of uh, not only looking at credit ratings, but also at ESG ratings and cutting off the worst 30%. A very simple approach, which you can, uh, I would say, transmit easily into central banks policies. Uh, we also offer custom-made portfolios where central banks then can tell us exactly what they would like to have in their portfolios. They can select the industries they would like to eliminate uh, and, and so on. Uh, we added uh, two, two or three years ago a dollar-denominated green bond fund as the demand uh, grew. And usually we, we work with advisory groups with a number of central banks to develop new products. Recently, a year ago or so, we added a euro-denominated bond. The demand is growing and we will add more products probably related to certain regions. Uh, why, why, why is the BS in a good position to do so? Well, first of all, uh, the cost of integrating all of that for relatively small asset management teams in central banks is high. You have to have the manpower, you have to have uh, the various uh, work streams. The BS can streamline that and offer this at a very, very attractive sort of uh, fee. Uh, we are able to talk to issuers, 
to improve their reporting. We can talk to issuers to broaden uh, the, the various uh, maturities and, and sizes in certain instances. We can help establish minimum standards. And, uh, and, and of course, we follow the best uh, market practices. Um, what uh, else uh, is the BAS actually doing in terms of uh, sustainability? Uh, well, we have also uh, equity, our own funds to manage, where we introduced early on, uh, a few years back already, a green uh, portfolio. Uh, so we made our first experiences maybe five years back, very soon after the Paris Agreement was signed and uh, uh, some central banks actually formed a small group to develop these ideas. It's now the Network on Green Financing, where, we're, where it's really a big number of central banks. Uh, we have a pension fund, which uh, actually also uh, in integrated uh, ESG, or also in particular climate-related criteria. Uh, just recently, uh, we started off not only with impact reporting, what we do for our BZIP, uh, for customers, impact reporting where we calculate carbon emissions saved, uh, uh, amounts of water saved or cleaned, uh, waste reduced. So you have some, some criteria or metrics where you can clearly show the advantage of being invested in these, uh, in these instruments. But there is a, a very steep curve, developing curve of developing metrics. And we, we do that in our pension fund, uh, where we try to find metrics related to, let's say, uh, carbon emissions saved versus uh, return or carbon emissions saved versus uh, value of assets. Because in the end, we think that the, the investment strategy will have to include, uh, I would say, risk management in the end. And some of our good, good counterparties central in the central bank world told me very early on when we discussed climate-related investments uh, and also the trade-off uh, between return, liquidity, uh, etc., uh, that we have to look at it a bit like we look at inflation linkers. There were periods where inflation was below 1%. And nobody thought that an inflation-linked uh, investment might make a lot of sense. Now, everybody who has some of this in the portfolio right now looks very good. Uh, it's a bit a form of insurance policy. And I think some central banks, when it comes to finding uh, a rationale for selecting uh, green bonds, ESG criteria, it's a bit of an insurance policy because you want to be invested in assets which are robust in various scenarios. And if you look at the portfolio as a whole and you diversify, you might want to have some of it and probably more of it as time goes by uh, in, in such a portfolio. So this is, I think, central yeah, I think banks. Just, just in the interest of time, I think we're gonna come back to those issues you mentioned, especially metrics, I think is a very important one. But just in the interest of time, Jonathan, you, you disappeared into a, a formless internet void for a second there. Do you want to do you want to just quickly finish the point you were making of, about uh, about the importance of of integrating this stuff in credit, and then we'll move on to Wilhelm. Yeah, Pierre, I wasn't sure if that was your stinky way of making sure I kept the time, but uh, but anyway, I'm back, and I apologize <laughs> to everybody for that. So I was just making the point that you know, given given credit, such an important part uh, of the asset management and, and reserves management for, uh, for for many central banks, we need to think about uh, the the credit as a tool for pursuing ESG integration and for moving towards net zero alignment. Um, and sometimes I think we we think about stewardship and engagement as solely an activity for equity investors or through ETF type products. Whereas we found that, you know, actually as a credit investor, providing primary capital to companies, uh, that, that actually there's an opportunity to have dialogue around disclosure and practices and, and ultimately alignment of that, of that capital allocation uh, with a more sustainable direction. Um, you know, so, so I think that's an important part of the process that, that you may not be able to do directly yourselves, but by using you know, your external managers and other parties, 
uh, or working in, in concert with other central banks in, in joint up uh, engagements can be helpful. Um, and then just finally, I, you know, I'd say, you know, one of the key things here is to develop clear frameworks for determining if an issuer is aligned with net zero and the climate transition or not. Um, uh, because tools like the European Union taxonomy on environmentally sustainable activities are helpful for identifying that Tesla makes electric vehicles, but, but it's much more complicated to look at whether the iron and steel company is going to make the necessary shift or not. And so, you know, we found that frameworks like the Transition Pathways Initiative from the London School of Economics and uh, uh, the work uh, of, of the Science-Based Targets Initiative are really helpful. We have a white paper which we can um, send around that sort of helps with how to implement all of this, um, which um, if you're interested, uh, please do take a look. I believe it's, it's posted in the, uh, in the relevant document box for this session. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, last but not least, Wilhelm, you are uh, the, uh, the former head of sustainability and the current global co-head of uh, corporate governance at the world's largest sovereign fund. Uh, so please share a little bit about your, uh, your approach and some brief opening remarks before we open the discussion. We have a lot of questions already. So, uh, yeah. Very good. And, uh, and, and thank you. And yes, I, um, yeah, I do not speak as a, as a central banker, even if I work uh, normally for a central bank. So, uh, but it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been interesting to listen to uh, the discussion so far. So, I think I'll I'll speak briefly then about our uh, our engagement strategy and give some examples on how we apply principles and and, and data. I might use climate change, I think, uh, as the example throughout. Uh, who are we? Yes, we are a, a big sovereign wealth fund. Uh, our assets belong to the Norwegian people. Our mission is to, to safeguard and build uh, build wealth for uh, future generations of Norwegians. Uh, and we invest in 9,000 companies around the world, earning, earning about 1.4% uh, uh, of all world's listed companies. So, so, so we come into this thinking that we have this inherent uh, interest in sustainability uh, because the world's economic, uh, environmental and social future is, is in a sense uh, our future. Uh, and we, we think that the long-term value creation uh, of the fund will depend on how well the companies manage uh, sustainability challenges, not, not least the climate transition, as, as others have pointed out already. As a globally um, invested uh, investor, diversified uh, in, in, in around 70 markets, we work from a set of commonly held principles. That's important to us. This, uh, have been formulated by, by well-known organizations as, as the UN and the OECD. And, and starting there gives, uh, we think, predictability and, and, and um, stability uh, of our uh, opinions. Compi contributing then to, to well-functioning markets uh, within that space, level playing fields and good corporate practices should uh, over time contribute to reduced risk and improved return for us. We need to also work from scale. Uh, or at scale. So with 9,000 investments, we, we formulate public expectations directed at the companies we invest in. We also have positions on, on specific uh, governance issues. And, and, and through having this public documentation, we ensure that companies uh, we invest in um, know our views and uh, through them that they manage uh, risks and opportunities hopefully in a way which which works uh, for us too but we're an institutional investor it's it's important to stress so our expectations are directed at the boards we don't seek to micromanage uh, companies so for climate change for example our starting point is that boards have oversight of climate related risks and opportunities uh, and that they account for the associated strategies and outcomes but we don't go in and say uh, this this plan is better than that plan, or you should uh, you should solve it this way. For example, we don't believe that to be appropriate from a point of view of, of corporate governance, essentially. So board accountability is uh, the one pillar of our uh, engagement work, and the other one is, as again has been touched upon, uh, disclosure. We believe that companies should disclose more clearly to shareholders the plans that they make, the risks they see, and the performance over time. We are a data-driven organization, and, and this data helps us prioritize our ownership and investment efforts. And what do we need to see them report? We've heard, uh, I think, uh, quite a few good climate examples already, but sort of more generally for us, it's about their risk exposure. So as we understand uh, how they're exposed to specific sustainability issues, uh, what, what they make, uh, where they are, uh, 
they, it's their management of those risks. Uh, so the systems they put in place to 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 monitor and uh, and correct, and then finally their performance, how they over time uh, uh, perform against the strategies, the plans, the targets they set, and 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 we'd obviously like this to be relevant and comparable and reliable uh, performance indicators, such, so that we can also conduct large scale analytical exercises. We do that already. We we analyze uh, companies' disclosures. We have models for sort of uh, modeling their implementation, if you will, of of, uh, of the management of climate uh, or sustainability risks and uh, and uh, the strategies they set. Um, and this helps us identify leaders and uh, laggards for uh, for engagement. It can tell us something about uh, the most exposed companies. And over time, I should say as well, we've seen improvements in how companies, according to our modeling, are uh, handling this. Uh, not too surprisingly, probably, but uh, it's still good to see. If companies fall short of meeting our expectations, we will engage with them to encourage them to, to improve practices and disclosures over time. Why then um, do we engage as uh, as such? Well, we believe uh, engagement is a very effective way, as I've uh, alluded to or highlighted already, to for us to convey views. But we also think, and it's important to 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 mention, I think that this is also the best, a good way for us to learn from companies. So this is just uh, as much about learning from companies the, about more about their strategies they, they, they take and, and thereby making improved investment decisions as well. So, so stewardship is, I suppose, the sort of common term, in, at least in my mind, cover, covering both, uh, uh, both elements. Um, when it comes to dialogue, a, a very sort of uh, visible uh, and important tool is voting. We have to vote at all general meetings and we do. And we will support uh, proposals that are in line with, uh, again, public voting guidelines and, and our expectations. We have a starting point that we support the board, but we will vote against the board if we believe that it's failed to, to adequately manage the, our interests as, as shareholders. Uh, transparency and predictability is, again, a core focus for us, just as we demanded of the company. So we publish all our voting intentions ahead of the board meeting. Uh, so that it's clear to the market and to the companies uh, where we stand. And we will explain our voting rationale where we vote against the boards. And in 2020, for example, we voted on 39 climate resolutions and supported 14. So uh, whereas we vote on 110,000 uh, items altogether, it's only, uh, a, only a, a, you know, a very small proportion that are actually related to, to sustainability. Um, and we would say as well that it's it's uh, in interesting to note that the small but growing uh, share of these resolutions are now winning uh, majority support. I think I'll, I'll stop here, actually. I hope this gave you the sort of flavor on how we work. Uh, yeah, and then I look forward to the questions. So, so yes, so um, a number of a number of places we could start, but I think we've received a number of questions that are circling around uh, the same theme. So I'll do my best to, to synthesize them. Um, uh, most of you uh, have spoken uh, so far about about investments in, in companies. Um, uh, however, uh, almost all of you are also significant investors in, in governments and in sovereigns. Uh, Martin, you were speaking earlier about your divestment from uh, Australian uh, regional uh, bonds. And that's, I think, that's an issue that a number of questions have raised. Um, that, that issue being, um, as, a, as a, an investor in government bonds for the purpose of liquidity and safety, how can you square those responsibilities with engagement with the sovereign? How do you engage with the sovereign? Um, what are the strategies that can be pursued to uh, say, I mean, you know, how, how, can, you, how can you engage with, with someone like, like the US Treasury or, or the German Ministry of Finance as an issuer? Um, so, so I'd like for us to, to kind of try to unpack this issue a little bit, um, and maybe, maybe Torsten, we could, we could start with you and then, and then maybe go around, uh, around the panel a little bit. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, that, that's kind of maybe the first thing we can, we can start with. We have some, yeah, it's a, it's an easy question for me and, and also a tricky one, I would say. 
uh, easy because uh, generally we don't like paying more for what we can uh, get in a cheaper way. So if you're talking specifically green bonds, you have to have a discussion on about the pricing, for instance. Uh, and if the price is, is off or it's more expensive to buy a green bond, as a starting point, it's uh, not something that we would uh, we want to invest in. Uh, so that's a general kind of a view. Um, uh, secondly, I would say, uh, as I mentioned before, and um, as a general principle, we don't engage in investments. We don't take an active investor stance. That also means that uh, it's easy for me to answer that we won't engage with governments uh, uh, specifically. Um, but it is something that we're looking into, and it is part of the discussions we're having internally. But it, for me, it would be an easy answer. Jonathan, would you like to come in on this point of, uh, of how you go about implementing this uh, from the perspective of something like sovereign debt? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's sensitive. Um, you know, I, I acknowledge that, right? Um, but one of the things actually we're, we're about to put a paper out is, uh, is, is around a framework for evaluating um, what we think of as being sustainable sovereign debt. So forget labeled bonds, you know, the green bonds or, or SDG bonds, but, but actually uh, putting in place uh, a framework for evaluating progress at delivering the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and hence trying to come up with a, uh, an approach to, to determining, you know, which um, sovereigns are, are making uh, appropriate progress. Um, so so uh, watch the space for, for, that, for that work. Um, but for, for about 15 years, we've been evaluating ESG characteristics as part of our sovereign debt analytical framework and certainly have found that there are a number of biases in the data, right? Basically high income countries, many of which are represented on this, on this panel today, uh, you know, tend to have stronger uh, ESG profiles. Um, and so, you know, if you're investing, uh, looking for some yield, you've got to be careful that you don't just end up uh, kind of concentrating again in, in sort of the lower yielding, highest income uh, 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 issuers. So one of the things that we've worked with a number of clients on is how can you get that extra yield uh, by, um, by allocating in it towards those issuers that have the strongest ESG profiles from within the sort of middle income uh, or, or, or developing uh, market perspective, um, given that, that you know, clearly we're, we're all looking for an ability to, to deliver on the return goals that we have, as well as the security uh, of the, uh, the credit profile. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Wilhelm, can I can I ask you to come in on this question? Maybe if you if you have some thoughts. I mean, you you invest in in a in a wide range of sovereign debt, so perhaps uh, you have you have views on this. Yes, no. I mean, I, I think I'd probably echo a little bit of what's been said, and and again, as a sovereign investor, uh, um, engaging with with sov other sovereigns is, is is often something that we well it's not often something it's something we are very uh, cautious about because the government of norway uh, is uh, you know uh, more than capable of uh, of pursuing objectives vis-a-vis -vis sovereigns uh, on on its own um but but we do obviously have a framework to to understand the risk and that framework uh, includes uh, esg uh, metrics um and um, and we're also noting that the market is changing a bit, and we have invested in uh, sovereign green bonds and uh, uh, issues, um, such issues as well. So um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's fine. no, that's good. That's good. Um, I I, I want to come back uh, to something that that Jonathan and, and Martin were, were were disagreeing on earlier. Um, Jonathan, you mentioned possibly lumpy spending on the transition. Uh, breeding some some price instability um, and Martin you were saying earlier in your introductory remarks that, that you don't see um, a clear link between price stability and uh, sustainability per se um, Martin could I ask you perhaps to, to respond to, to Jonathan's points on uh, on price instability and kind of the, the cost impacts of the climate transition is that something that I could ask you to uh, to expand on uh, yes, of course. So, so what, what I didn't mean, I, I didn't mean that uh, climate change uh, will not have an impact for monetary policy. I said it very clearly. It, it will have an impact, and we, we have to understand it. But our we cannot say that this will be a problem for price stability, and therefore we have to be active. That's my point, and I've heard some people saying that. Suppose that the global warming was helpful for achieving price stability, uh, 
would we argue that central banks should uh, promote global warming? Obviously not. So it's, to me, it's obvious that we cannot use the, the central bank's primary objectives as a motivation for being activists. That's the only thing I'm saying. And it should be obvious, I, I think. But on the other hand, I think it's obvious, if, even if it's not explicit in your mandates, it's obvious that central banks, if they can, without uh, endangering the primary objectives, they should promote the general uh, economic policies of their governments. Uh, I think that's also rather straightforward. And most governments are very active in, in uh, trying to mitigate climate change. So, so that gives a scope for central banks to be relatively active. I, I also want to comment a little bit on, on, the, on the sovereigns. So, because we, we did something there. And, and uh, as I said, holding the, the most liquid and useful uh, uh, asset, US treasuries, and to, to some extent, the uh, German bonds, uh, bonds it's part of our, our primary mandate, according to our interpretation. We need it to, to promote financial stability. So we cannot rule out that. But if we diversify away a little bit from that to, to seek higher returns or less risk, we, we have to also consider uh, the, the climate impact. That, that's what, what we concluded. And, and we didn't really, we didn't diversify away from, from the germ, from the, uh, Australian or Canadian sovereigns, we just reallocated from the different regions to, to other regions. Uh, so, so that's what, what we did. Uh, I can also comment a little bit about green bonds. I, I think that's complicated when it's sovereign. So, and in particular, the Swedish government's green bonds, we are treating as any other Swedish sovereign bond. I, I think that's a little bit like Torsten said. Um, and in particular, because the Swedish government is our principal, we should, it would be absurd if we tried with our purchases to have, give incentives to our principal or affect how, how they invest. So it's, they have one budget and we can't really separate the green and the brown budget for, for the domestic sovereigns. For other countries, it's a bit more complicated and we have so far no clear conclusion, I, I think, on, on that question. Thanks, Martin. Um... Uh, another question that's come in, I think perhaps a, a slightly slightly broader before we um, we turn to some other issues. I mean, um, it, it's a challenging one because uh, because of the scope. But I'll I'll put this I'll put this to uh, to you, Torsten. First, um, I, I have complete faith in your ability to to tackle this. Um, it's it's a question from from uh, from uh, JP Craven Investment Management Associate at, at, at BlackRock. Do you see ESG implementation and secondary market investing? as having a dramatic impact on the climate transition beyond an incremental lowering of cost of capital for greener firms? And if yes, how, or do you see the major progress being driven by primary markets and or regulatory changes? So a question about really the, uh, the, the, the channels through which ESG implementation can, can foster the, the climate transition. So Torsten, do you, do you wanna have a go at, at tackling that question perhaps? It is a really good question, I would say. Um, you can give a lot of theoretical arguments about cost of capital and a lot of things, and I think we all know them. Um, if I am to take a different approach, I would say that it's probably been said before, um, but if anything has to change, the government has to uh, be a driver of this. Uh, government policies, we all have to take our part. Um, so at best, I would say on the investment side, we can induce, we can uh, support, we can um, maybe, if done uh, cleverly, we can um, help. But it can, uh, can never be, in my opinion, the, the primary driver of change. And um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's a politician's answer, but um, yeah, I'll leave <laughs> no, it at no, that. I think, I think that's a fair way to, to approach this. Um, let's, let's, let's see. Uh, uh, I mean, Jonathan, do you want to come in on this point, perhaps, on, the, on this issue? Yeah, look, I mean, we all know that ca you know, cash is fungible. And so the primary secondary thing, is, you know, that there are limitations to that. You know, primary debt is, is rollovers in a lot of cases. But it, obviously, you have a little bit more influence in, in the primary market, um, uh, for sure. But I'd say, look, look the, 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 the role of dialogue with issuers should be happening all the year round, not just when they come to market. Um, you know, we, we, we've got great examples of 
companies that we're talking to a dozen times a year um, who are uh, you know who 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 are having a long term relationship with around the alignment journey. Um, and so, you know, that may not be something that central banks uh, in all cases can do with their internally managed assets, but, you know, so important that they that they partner with and select um, external managers and service providers who who are being held to a high standard on that. Um, you know, if, if you're going to depend on them for the stewardship activities, are they actually casting the votes and having dialogue with the credit portfolio, you know, um, uh, that, that meets those expectations. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely think that even in secondary markets, there's plenty of opportunity to use that as an opportunity for dialogue with issuers. Martin, can I ask you to come in on this point as well on, on, uh, on lowering the cost of capital versus uh, sort of broader impact in primary markets? I know your, your colleagues at the Riks Bank have, have written a lot of good work about uh, climate and, and long-run interest rates. Uh, so perhaps, perhaps you can come in on this on this point. Well, uh, actually, I'm I'm afraid I don't have anything really intelligent to to, to say That's about okay. it. It's, it's okay. a very different, difficult question. I, I it, think. it is it is a challenging question. Yeah. Okay, so so in that case, um, I'll move on to to Peter for a question around um, fiduciary duties. Uh, again, here sort of uh, blending together a number of a number of questions. Um, uh, one, one, one point from, uh, from uh, Mr. Trevino, uh, former CEO of the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund asks, is there a governance risk and even a conflict of interest in pursuing ESG goals, in particular for institutional investors, such as pension funds, that have fiduciary duties to protect the pension promise when investing in ESG? There seems to be at least a loss of focus, uh, says Mr. Trevino. And uh, related to that, a question from the, uh, from the, um, from the German uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, to add to Sergio's question, how did the BIS pension fund get the mandate to invest in ESG assets? So, Peter, could you uh, could you give us a sense of uh, of uh, your thoughts on those two questions, or on that, that one issue rather? So, Peter, you're you're still on mute, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, first question: uh, fiduciary duties. Uh in a pension fund against, uh, let's say, the pensioners or future pensioners, definitely you have, uh, you have a duty. And in the case of the BAS pension fund, uh, it's a very small uh, number of people, of course, because we, we don't have a huge number of employees. So our staff is involved in these decisions. The pension fund committee even has members of the staff committee. Uh, and, and therefore, there is an integrated approach uh, when, when we come to the, uh, let's say, selection of, uh, of uh, uh, portfolio or structure of portfolios. And insofar, I think this is a relatively easy situation for a, a very small and closed pension fund. It's completely different if you have uh, 100,000 or more people uh, in, in such a fund. Of course, you might have also tranches like uh, in, in many pension systems, uh, the future pensioners can choose a program with a higher risk, lower risk, higher share of equity, lower share of equity. I think uh, in terms of uh, a product design, you could also add uh, one, one, I would say, uh, layer uh, which has a higher degree of ESG criteria in it. So I think there, there are ways to overcome that potential problem. Uh, in terms of, let's say, if you talk about uh, fiduciary duties on, on third, uh, third party asset management, uh, of course, and we, we get a lot of, I would, I would say we are in the process of getting a higher degree and, and better regulation. This market is still very early. It's not mature. Uh, people are starting to analyze a lot of different aspects, trying to develop metrics, trying to develop not only Ex ante expectations, because in a young market, you can hope that the effects you are assessing before you invest will materialize. But after five or six years, the picture might look slightly different. And therefore, I think in this process, regulation will play uh, clearly a bigger role. And I, I, I just uh, re re can uh, uh, mention that this European Union uh, uh, initiative about the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation uh, is probably one of the uh, one of the steps which will happen in, in many jurisdictions, and therefore I think uh, 
with a higher degree of regulation which will come. Uh, and I have no doubt about that. Uh, the uh, fiduciary duties will be much clearer defined. And even if somebody tries to, let's say, fulfill the highest standards today, uh, might not be uh, what, has be, what has to be uh, delivered in a year or two years' time. So I guess these duties will develop and uh, uh, it will be very interesting to see how this can be harmonized between jurisdictions. Because what, what we see when we uh, look at green bond uh, or ESG uh, related instruments globally, that the standards, standards are still very, very different. And uh, I think the investor in the end needs more clarity, more uh, transparency, and also uh, a better degree of uh, analytical tools. Yes, there's this question of, of, of freezing standards and, and metrics in place in, in, a, in, a, in a universe that's evolving so rapidly is a very, is a very challenging and opposite uh, point, I think. I mean, Wilhelm, do you want to kind of come in on this and, and tell us maybe how you how you guys at Enbim have been grappling with this challenge. I mean, in such a rapidly changing space, how do you avoid sort of being frozen two years in the past or, or somewhere somewhere that's not quite right um, on, on, the, on the data and metrics side? What are your, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> yeah, I don't have. I mean, I don't have a perfect perfect answer to that. No, I mean, there's. I, I don't expect you to. There, there is, uh, there is clearly a lot going on, and there's clearly, you know. A lot of things we don't uh, understand well enough, starting from you know the relationships with uh, with uh, profitability uh, through the channel that it's the market and how things are priced and and and, and ultimately you know uh, how how the companies uh, perform, what are the right metrics, how do we make it, uh, you know how how do we achieve the the standardization we we need? So we are basically trying to be involved and contribute to standard setting as well, and that's why we're part of. Uh, the steering group of transition pathway initiative which was just uh, well mentioned earlier on and uh, and we're on uh, SASB's uh, advisory board and uh, and we are uh, uh, involved at various levels with with many others uh, standard setters and uh, and regulators around uh, in in the markets we invest in and and then we work internally uh, we built a non financial database over the last about 10 years so we have a, we we get a lot of this data we look at the raw data as far as we can and then we uh, build uh, our own uh, models on that basis rather than uh, rely on on third party rankings and so on for, for the very reason that at least then we are a little bit maybe uh, more uh, more flexible and nimble um, and and can and and we know uh, what uh, what at least what goes into our own uh, models and uh, and can understand our output, uh, but you know yeah uh, it's uh, it's work in progress. So uh, I think just uh, uh, being I think for, for every institution being being careful about what you're trying to understand and and then vary of uh, the gaps that are there and the limitations in the information you are. Uh, uh, you're using uh, is uh, yeah at least a, a good start. Staying nimble is uh, is what I'll, what I'll take from that. I think that's generally a good catchphrase to uh, to apply to this uh, to this space. Um, I I think there are so many more issues we could unpack here. Um, unfortunately, we only have about a minute and a half left. So uh, on this on this point of uh, freezing standards, freezing uh, what, what's available at the moment in a rapidly evolving universe, Jonathan, can I ask you to? To wrap things up with with your views on on that issue, and um, and uh, and then we'll close it after that. There's that analogy about someone trying to uh, stop the waves uh, coming into to the beach that I <laughs> I think may be apt in this context. So, look, I I I think the key thing is that uh, standards and, and and regulation responding to market feedback and uh, enabling. Uh, you know the the practical allocation of capital uh, to uh, to opportunities that are stronger from a risk adjusted uh, basis, so that everybody on this call can achieve the investment objectives that they've got in a sustainable fashion. Um, so you know the the some of the standards do a great job of that. Um, some maybe need to to engage more with uh, market participants to ensure that they're they're helpful from that perspective. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, thank you to all of you again for joining us. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't uh, unpack everything that we, we said we would, um, but 
there will be future occasions, no doubt. Um, so uh, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I believe the next session in, in our symposium is uh, my colleague John Orchard uh, and a panel on green capital markets. So I uh, hope uh, that is as engaging as this was. Uh, so, so thank you again for joining us and uh, speak soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.